पेज थर्टीन चैप्टर टू वी आर नॉट अफ्रेड टू डाई इफ वी कैन ऑल बी टूगेदर बाय गॉर्डन कुक एंड एलन ईस्ट नोटिस दीज एक्सप्रेशन इन द टेक्स्ट इन फर दे आर मीनिंग फ्रॉम द कॉन्टेक्सट वन हॉर्निंग आर सी फेयरिंग स्किल्स टू ओमनियस साइलेंस थ्री मे डे कॉल्स फोर पिन प्रिक्स इन द वास्ट ओशियन फाइव अटाउस्ड हेड नाउ द टेक्स्ट इन जुलाई 1976, my wife Mary, son Jonathan six, daughter Susan seven, and I set sail from Plymouth, England, to duplicate the round-the-world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. For the longest time, Mary and I, a 37-year-old businessman, had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer. and for the past 16 years we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in british waters our boat wave walker a 23 meter 30 ton wooden hulled beauty had been professionally built and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find the first leg of our planned 3 year 105000 km journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town there before heading east we took on two crewmen american larry vigil and swiss herb sigler to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas the southern indian ocean page 14 On our second day out of Cape Town, we begin to encounter strong gales. For the next few weeks, they blew continuously. Gales did not worry me, but the size of the waves was alarming. Up to 15 meters, as high as our main mast. December 25 found us 3500 kilometers east of Cape Town. Despite atrocious weather, we had a wonderful holiday complete with a Christmas tree. New Year's Day saw no improvement in the weather, but we reasoned that it had to change soon, and it did change for the worse. At dawn on January 2, the waves were gigantic. We were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making 8 knots. As the ship rose to the top of each wave, we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us, and the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. To slow the boat down, we dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the stern. Then we double lashed everything, went through our life raft drill, attached lifelines. donned oil skins and life jackets and waited the first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 pm with an ominous silence the wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered aft of the ship with horror i realized that it was not a cloud but a wave like no other i had ever seen it appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest the roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment i thought we might ride over it but then a tremendous explosion shook the deck A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship. My head smashed into the wheel and I was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves. I accepted my approaching death and as I was losing consciousness, 
आई फेल्ट क्वाइट पीसफुल अनएक्सपेक्टेडली माय हेड पॉप्ड आउट ऑफ वाटर अ फ्यू मीटर्स अवे वेव वॉकर वॉज नियर कैप्साइजिंग हर मास्ट ऑलमोस्ट हॉरिजोंटल देन अ वेव हर्ड हर अपराइट my lifeline jerked taut i grabbed the guard rails and sailed through the air into wave walkers main boom subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll my left ribs cracked my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth somehow i found the wheel lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on water water everywhere I could feel that the ship had water below but I dared not abandon the wheel to investigate Page 15 Suddenly the front hatch was thrown open and Mary appeared We are sinking she screamed The decks are smashed we are full of water Take the wheel I shouted as I scrambled for the hatch Larry and Herb were pumping like madmen broken timbers hung at crazy angles the whole starboard side bulged inwards clothes crockery charts tins and toys sloshed about in deep water i half swam half crawled into the children's cabin are you all right i asked yes they answered from a upper bunk but my head hurts a bit said sue pointing to a big bump above her eyes i had no time to worry about bumped heads after finding a hammer screws and canvas i struggled back on deck with the starboard side bashed open we were taking water with each wave that broke over us if i couldn't make some repairs we would surely sink somehow i managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes some water continued to stream below but most of it was now being deflected over the side more problems arose when our hand pumps started to block up with the debris floating around the cabins and the electric pump short circuited the water level rose threateningly back on deck i found that our two spare hand pumps had been wrenched overboard along with the forestay sail the jib the dinghies and the main anchor then i remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor i connected it to an outpipe and was thankful to find that it worked the night dragged on with an endless bitterly cold routine of pumping steering and working the radio we were getting no replies to our midday calls which was not surprising in this remote corner of the world sue's head had swollen alarmingly she had two enormous black eyes and now she showed us a deep cut on her arm when i asked why she hadn't made more of her injuries before this she replied i didn't want to worry you when you were trying to save us all by morning on january 3 the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for us to take 2 hours rest in rotation but we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the water line and on checking i found that nearly all the boat's main reef frames were smashed down to the keel page 16 in fact there was nothing holding up a whole section of the starboard hull except a few cupboard partitions we had survived for 15 hours since the wave hit but wave walker wouldn't hold together long enough for us to reach australia i checked our charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east one of them ile amsterdam was a french scientific base our only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean but unless the wind and seas abated so we could hoist sail our chances would be slim indeed the great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action on january 
after 36 hours of continuous pumping, we reached the last few centimeters of water. Now we had only to keep pace with the water still coming in. We could not set any sail on the main mast. Pressure on the rigging would simply pull the damaged section of the hull apart. So we hoisted the storm jib and headed for where I thought the two islands were. Mary found some corned beef and cracker biscuits and we ate our first meal in almost two days. But our respite was short-lived. At 4 p.m., black clouds began building up behind us. Within the hour, the wind was back to 40 knots and the seas were getting higher. The weather continued to deteriorate throughout the night and by dawn on January 5, our situation was again desperate. When I went in to comfort the children, John asked, Daddy, are we going to die? I tried to assure him that we could make it. But Daddy, he went on, we aren't afraid of dying if we can all be together, you and Mummy, Sue and I. I could find no words with which to respond. But I left the children's cabin determined to fight the sea with everything I had. To protect the weakened starboard side, I decided to heave to with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves using an improvised sea anchor of heavy nylon rope and two 22-liter plastic barrels of paraffin. That evening, Mary and I sat together holding hands as the motion of the ship brought more and more water in through the broken planks. We both felt the end was very near. But Wave Walker rode out the storm and by the morning of January 6, with the wind easing, I tried to get a reading on the sextant. Back in the chart room, I worked on wind speeds, changes of course, drift and current in an effort to calculate our position. Page 17 the best I could determine was that we were somewhere in 1,50,000 kilometers of ocean looking for a 65 kilometer wide island. While I was thinking, Sue, moving painfully, joined me. The left side of her head was now very swollen and her blackened eyes narrowed to slits. She gave me a card she had made. On the front she had drawn caricatures of Mary and me with the words, Here are some funny people. Did they make you laugh? I laughed a lot as well. Inside was a message, Oh, how I love you both. So this card is to say thank you and let's hope for the best. Somehow, we had to make it. I checked and rechecked my calculations. We had lost our main compass and I was using a spare which had not been corrected for magnetic variation. I made an allowance for this and another estimate of the influence of the westerly currents which flow through this part of the Indian Ocean. About 2 p.m., I went on deck and asked Larry to steer a course of 185 degrees. If we were lucky, I told him with a conviction I did not feel. He could expect to see the island at about 5 p.m. Then with a heavy heart, I went below, climbed on my bunk and amazingly dozed off. When I woke, it was 6 p.m. and growing dark. I knew we must have missed the island and with the sail we had left, we couldn't hope to beat back into the westerly winds. At that moment, a tousled head appeared by my bunk. Can I have a hug? Jonathan asked. Sue was right behind him. Why am I getting a hug now? I asked. Because you're the best daddy in the whole world and the best captain. My son replied. Not today, John. I'm afraid. Why, you must be, said Sue in a matter-of-fact voice. You found the island. What? I shouted. It's out there in front of us, they chorused as big as a battleship. I rushed on deck and gazed with relief 
at the stark outline of Ile Amsterdam. It was only a bleak piece of volcanic rock with little vegetation, the most beautiful island in the world. Page 18 We anchored offshore for the night and the next morning all 28 inhabitants of the island cheered as they helped us ashore. With land under my feet again, my thoughts were full of Larry and Herbie, cheerful and optimistic under the direst stress, and of Mary, who stayed at the wheel for all those crucial hours. Most of all, I thought of a seven-year-old girl who did not want us to worry about a head injury, which subsequently took six minor operations to remove a recurring blood clot between skin and skull and of a six-year-old boy who was not afraid to die. Understanding the text 1. List the steps taken by the captain. First, to protect the ship when rough weather began. Second, to check the flooding of the water in the ship. 2. Describe the mental condition of the voyagers on 4 and 5th January. 3. Describe the shifts in the narration of the events as indicated in the three sections of the text. Give a subtitle to each section. Talking about the text. Discuss the following questions with your partner. 1. What difference did you notice between the reaction of the adults and the children when faced with danger? 2. How does the story suggest that optimism helps to endure the direst stress? 3. What lessons do we learn from such hazardous experiences when we are face to face with death? 4. Why do you think people undertake such adventurous expeditions in spite of the risk involved? Thinking about language 1. We have come across words like gale and storm in the account. Here are two more words for storm. Typhoon, cyclone. How many words does your language have for storm? Page 19. 2. Here are the terms for different kinds of vessels. Yacht. Boat, canoe, ship, steamer, schooner. Think of similar terms in your language. 4. Have you heard any boatman's songs? What kind of emotions do these songs usually express? Working with words. 1. The following words used in the text as ship terminology are also commonly used in another sense. In what context would you use the other meaning? The words are not, stern, boom, hatch, anchor. 2. The following three compound words end in ship. What does each of them mean? Words are Airship, flagship, lightship. 3. The following are the meanings listed in the dictionary against the phrase take on. In which meaning is it used in the third paragraph of the account? Take on something. To begin to have a particular quality or appearance. To assume something. Take somebody on, to employ somebody, to engage somebody, to accept somebody as one's opponent in a game, contest or conflict. Take somebody or something on. To decide to do something, to allow something, somebody to enter. Take somebody or something on. To decide to do something, to allow something or somebody to enter. Example, a bus, 
plane or ship to take something or somebody on board things to do one given on the next page is a picture of a yacht label the parts of the yacht using the terms given in the box page 20 words are bow cabin rudder cockpit stern boom mainsail mast mast two here is some information downloaded from the internet on isle amsterdam you can view images of the isle if you go online location south indian ocean between southern most parts of australia and south africa latitude and longitude 3792 south 7767 east sovereignty france political status notes part of french southern and antarctic lands population 35 census notes meteorological station staff land area in square kilometers 86 3 locate isle amsterdam on the world map page 21 notes This is the first person account of an adventurous ordeal that a family experiences. Understanding the text, this section deals with factual and global comprehension. Practice is given in describing and noticing text organization. Talking about the text, peer interaction about subjective responses to the text, empathy with and comment on universal experiences and human behavior related to risk taking and adventure thinking about language one variety of terms for a particular item in different languages two english words derived from indian languages three linking language to music example boatman's songs working with words one ship terms as homonyms two compound words with ship with different connotations three phrasal verbs things to do one honing reference skills by finding facts from the internet the encyclopedia and maps two exposure to various genres of fact presentation you were just listening to this chapter it was presented by cieet ncert new delhi india